Welcome back, welcome back, friends and neighbors, to this Packet Guide series of networking videos. Hey, we haven't done one of these in a little while, and you can see from the title that we're actually covering Chapter 9 in the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols. And you're probably going, what? Chapter 9? And that's because I've just written another couple of chapters for this particular book. So we're going to be covering over the next couple of weeks, chapters 9 and 10, TCP and UDP. And along with that, we'll do lots of fun stuff like DNS and DHCP and port scanning and all that kind of stuff. So without further ado, chapter 9 in the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols from O'Reilly. All right, as we go through some of the TCP and UDP topics, maybe what we ought to cover first are some of the ideas. One of the big ideas for both of them is a socket. A socket is simply comprised of the source and destination IP addresses and the source and destination ports. So when two software processes are talking to each other across a network, they use this idea of a socket. And that becomes really, really important to us. The client and server software that we sometimes talk about are the two ends of the connections. So you connect to a server because you want something. So for example, you want to go out to a web page and you connect to the web server to do that. And you use that with your browser. Your browser technically is your client. And sometimes we also talk about client and server machines. Well, a server class machine is just a more robust machine, RAM, processing, etc., that has the ability to run the software server and maybe deal with lots and lots of connections from the clients. Client machines can be just about anything, smartphones, laptops, what have you. Another important idea is, is the MAC addresses are not part of this conversation. And in a perfect world, you will never, ever, ever know the MAC address of somebody that's not on your network. So really, again, what we're dealing with here are source and destination ports and source and destination IP addresses. And this particular image just shows a computer with several different clients, similar to the connections that you might have when you're doing your own kind of networking. You know, you got your email open, you got a game open, you got your browser open, and those go to actually individual separate servers. TCP and UDP are both what we call layer four protocols or transport protocols. This means they live above the IP layer or layer three. And so they have their own set of addressing, their own sets of fields. Applications are typically written to be either TCP or UDP. So take advantage of the functions of either one of those transport protocols. Now, another big idea is connection-oriented or connection-less. The funny thing is that the RFC doesn't actually use these terms very often at all. But connection-oriented means that we're really concerned about the bytes. We want to make sure that all the bytes or all the data gets from source and destination. So TCP is very concerned with sequence numbers and keeping track of the bytes, etc., etc. UDP says, eh, you know, if I lose some, it's okay. I'm not really going to track it down. Now, another important uh, way to think about this is that are we talking about a stream of information or are we talking about something that's command and response? So, for example, when you go to a web page, particularly if it's one of those really busy web pages like YouTube, there's a lot of information that comes down to you. So you establish a single TCP connection, and then all of that data comes down to you, and we need to keep track of it all. This is as opposed to something that is command and response like a question. So you ask a question, and you get an answer. A really good example of that is DNS. DNS says, hey, I'd like this particular IP address for this particular name. And you get the answer back, and then you're pretty much done. That's it. So that's another way to think about connection-oriented versus connection-less. So let's take a look at the RFC version of the TCP header. And you can see here that starting from the top and reading right or reading left to right, we have the source and destination ports, sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers right there up front. Well, we have actually 65,000 possibilities in each one of those. Um, and we'll see how that works a little bit later on. A little farther down and right in the middle of the screen, you can see that we have all of our, what we call our flags. The urgent, ACK, PUSH, RESET, SYN, and FIN flags. Then we got this thing called window and so on and so forth. And then following that is the encapsulated data. 
So that's the RFC version. It's very clean. It's nice to look at every once in a while, but it's hard to relate this to real life a lot of times. So let's take a look at a real packet from a Wireshark capture. This image is right out of the chapter that you'll see uh, as you're if you're reading through there. And I've, I've highlighted some of the big parts there. We've got the source and destination ports there, sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. There's our flags field. In this particular case, we have a push and an act flag, and then our window size. And then all the way at the bottom, you can see the data. In this case, we're encapsulating 405 bytes of data. That number becomes important to us later on as we start tracking what some of these numbers mean. From this image, you can also see that we started with an Ethernet frame and that encapsulates an IP packet and that encapsulates a TCP uh, datagram or segment and then we have the data and because we're going to port 80 we can see that that's HTTP so we can see that the data in this particular case is actually part of a web page now that we have our hands wrapped around sort of what's in a TCP packet let's talk about some of our operational basics one of the big things that we talk about when we're looking at TCP connections are our handshakes. We have a setup handshake when you initially connect, and then we have a teardown. TCP likes graceful teardowns, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the big parts of the handshake is to get your sequence numbers correct so that everybody knows what sequence numbers we're going to use for this particular connection. And then, of course, we can allocate the resources for the connection if we decide that the client is allowed this connection. Flags tell us what's happening. So we'll see that at the beginning part of the connection, we'll see a lot of SYN flags. And at the end, we see a lot of FIN flags. So that tells us kind of what's going on. Sequence numbers are a really important part of TCP. We're not actually going to talk about those in this video. We're going to save that for the next video. But sequence numbers and the associated idea of sliding window are really, really important parts of TCP. And if you can latch on to how those work, then you have a pretty good handle on TCP. Now, TCP has been around since 1981, so more than 30 years. And of course, they were thinking about it before they wrote the RFC. So there's been a lot of opportunity to change or modify TCP's behavior. And usually that's in the form of an add-on, something else TCP can do. Now, before I handle handshakes, I wanted to mention the flags field. So when I say, oh, a, a startup handshake or a connection handshake has a SYN, SYNAC, ACK, what I'm really talking about are the flags that we're going to set. And you can see that in the highlighted portion of this image, where those SYN and FIN flags are, where the acknowledgement flags are. And so this is actually what we're talking about. So when somebody says, oh, we're doing, I, I'm looking at a SYN packet or I'm looking at a FIN packet, they're really talking about the flag that has been set for that particular packet. And we have a, a collection of these, as you can see, and they're right smack dab in the middle of the TCP packet. Here are the two handshakes. And again, these are right out of the chapter. So these will be the images that I'll be writing about. And these are the very set of packets that you'll see. So if you're following along in this, in this video, you can actually uh, go through the same exact set of packets as you're reading through the chapter. All right, the top image here is a startup connection. Every single well-formed TCP connection starts in the exact same way. The client here, in this case 192.168.1.1, connects to the server at 192.168.1.254. And he does this, he says, hey, I'd like to connect to you by sending a TCP packet with the SYN flag set. The server says, well, I'm going to send you the other side of my connection. So the second step is that the server, 1.254 in this case, comes back with a SYN ACK. And then the last stage of the three-way handshake is that 192.168.1.1 sends an ACK back. Now, here's a little tickler for what we're going to talk about later. You can see that in these particular packets, the sequence number for the first one is zero. The sequence number and the acknowledgement number for the second packet are 0 and 1. And then the sequence number and acknowledgement number for the third packet are 1 and 1. Those become important to us because we can see that we've sort of zeroed out our sequence and acknowledgement numbers. We'll also learn that these are not the actual sequence numbers. These are what we call relative sequence numbers. But the important thing here is that we've zeroed them out. So you connect it and you can see that in packets 5 through 10 there, I've got some data going on. 
And then toward the end, packets 21 through 24, we actually have the teardown handshake. And we've got a fin ack, and then an ack, and a fin ack. We've got a push flag in there too, and then an ack. And these are the two sides of the connection saying, hey, listen, I'm done. So the client says, I'm done. By the way, here's what um, data I'm acknowledging from you. And the server comes back with, oh, okay, you want to be done. I'll acknowledge that you want to be done. And then the server says, you know what, I'm done too. And he sends a fin packet, and then the client acknowledges this. So this is a very graceful sort of, of teardown. It's kind of like you being in a phone call, and you say, all right, goodbye. And the other person says, all right, goodbye, as opposed to you just hanging up. So this is what we call a very graceful teardown. And those are our two handshakes for TCP. Now, this is another view of the handshake. This is another tool right in, in, uh, in Wireshark you can use to follow a connection. And on the right-hand side, you've got the sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. And this makes it very easy to follow. And just a reminder that these are relative sequence numbers. But on the left-hand side, we can see that I've got the startup and the teardown handshakes indicated there and the associated flags that are part of those connections. And in between is the data. You can see that we're... Um, We've got packet lengths of 405, 560, 560, 560, and 227. That tells us how much data is being sent back and forth. But that's just another view of the handshake in Wireshark. Well, I think that'll about do it for this one. This has been Chapter 9 from the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols from O'Reilly. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about a little more TCP stuff. We'll do sequence numbers and sliding window. Uh, thanks very much for watching, thanks for listening, and may your packets always reach their destinations.